All right, well, let's uh, begin. And uh, good morning and welcome to our Sunday school 9 o'clock hour. So those of you who are here and those of you who are online and, and watching through the church app. So why don't we uh, begin in an opening word of uh, prayer. Father God, we come before you. We thank you that we can come into your presence, into your holy of holies, that you have allowed us to call you not just Father, but call you God, call you Yahweh, call you Savior, call you Lord. We thank you for the gift of Jesus, our Savior. We thank you for the life he lived on this earth for his death on the cross, for his resurrection. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit that has been promised to each of us. We thank you that we're sealed for eternity, that this sealing can never be broken. We thank you for the truth of your word, your holy word that you have given us to instruct us on how to live our lives daily, so that we might bring glory and honor and praise to your holy name. I pray as we dig into your word, that all the anxiety in our lives, the things that are consuming us now, Holy Spirit, I pray that, I pray that you would clear their minds to hear the truth of what you want them to hear. Speak through me your words. Encourage your church to want to know you more intimately, to want to love you more intimately, and to realize the power we have with the Holy Spirit that indwells each of us who call on the name of Christ. Forgive us when we trespass against you. Forgive us for the sins we commit. We don't even know we commit because you are so holy. Cleanse us with your righteousness. Cleanse us with your truth. Forgive us of our sins. Help us to walk that path that you have set before each of us. A path that you desire to, for us to glorify you in. So I pray this morning that our minds would be open to the truth that you will be speaking to us, that you would be honored and glorified. We pray these things because of our precious Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us the ability to do such a thing. In his name we pray, amen. We're continuing our series on knowing God that classical book by J.I. Packer, and this week we're on chapter 6, The Holy Spirit. I want to share a little bit with you and, and be as transparent as I can. It was about 12 weeks ago, Kimberly, my wife came to me and said, you need to start teaching again. And, uh, And I've known that I need to start teaching. But when she actually said that, she wasn't saying that just necessarily because she knows I need to start teaching. She was saying that because she saw something in my life that wasn't right. And she recognized that I have not been in the Word of God as much as I normally am. So that was her way of saying, hey, you might want to slow down and think a little bit about where you're at spiritually with God. 34 years of marriage, next week, October 11th, I've learned over the years to listen to those little Q words. They don't always mean necessarily what they mean. Of course she wants me to teach, but there was something else behind that. that. It's been a rather stressful year for many of us, for sure, let alone the COVID-19 that we've been dealing with. Last year, I decided to start to uh, stop one uh, course. I was working on a 
MDiv degree through the Southern Baptist uh, Theological Seminary. I decided I need to go back and finish my bachelor's degree in business. And uh, otherwise, I'd be losing some credits of classes, and I didn't want to do that. What I didn't realize is how much I had forgotten over a 20-year period and how stressful actually that would actually be for me. And unfortunately, she got to live through some of that stress as I'm trying to figure out statistics and new equations and things that really have no application in my real life job, but need to learn them. And so it all led up to everything of, hey, where are you at with God right now? And so I went to Bob and said, Bob, I, I need a, if it's all right, I'd like to start teaching again. Uh, I'd like to teach at this church. I've never taught here. I've been teaching probably for 40 years of my life, almost from the day I was saved. Uh, and Bob said, sure. And uh, he says, we're going to be teaching on J.I. Packer's book, Knowing God. And I said, great, that's a classic. It's one of the very first books I read many, many, many moons ago. He said, hey, the first subject you're going to teach on is idolatry. And I'm like, at the time, I'm thinking, I don't got a problem with idolatry. And now I taught you guys, right? I just want you to know, as much as I taught you guys, whatever I taught you that three or four weeks ago, that's exactly what God had to deal with in my own heart. All right, it's amazing how he does that. And so I never prepare a message with what I think the church or what you need to know. The message is always what does God want me to learn in the truths of his written word. And from that I get to share with you. I probably learned that because I sat under John MacArthur for 20 years of my life. And I heard that often from the pulpit. Oftentimes he would be preaching, he would just say, I'm just sharing just some of the nuggets of what I've learned. I can't even actually share everything, all the truths that are there. And that's how I realized when I got that subject of idolatry a couple weeks, a few weeks back, <clears throat> at first I thought, oh, what do they need to learn, right? Because I don't have a problem. And then I was realized, I came to reality, wait a minute, what am I saying? That's not even how I approach the word. All right, God. There's obviously something you want me to learn here. And it was very uh, revealing for me to realize that I allowed things to get in my life that were hindering me in my spiritual journey with him. A couple of weeks back, then Bob said, I want you to teach on the Holy Spirit. And I said, that's great. I started teaching that. I got the lesson, got the, halfway through the lesson. Then I get a call, right, from Bobby who says, hey, Oh, we made a, we made a um, error. We're sorry, but we have missionaries coming in. I said, no problem. That's okay, because I truly believe in the sovereignty of God. He's always in control of everything, right? And uh, the next week, then Bob says, hey, yeah, we made the, made the error. He reaches out. Would you, would you mind teaching on, right, not the Holy Spirit now. Would you mind teaching on? Uh, chapters, I think, it was what Jeremy taught, did a great job last week. I said, sure. So I actually started preparing a lesson for that. And then he texts me, gives me a text on Sunday morning. Well, uh, you probably were watching online because I'm in Washington half the time. He says, well, you probably saw Jeremy did a great job. Uh, would you mind doing the Holy Spirit again? And, you know, in God's providence, right, my reply to Bob was no problem. Because in God's providence, he was using all of that, right? He had a plan. He was changing my life. He was molding me. Some of the things I learned, I was studying, right, was what I had to hear. So he had to pause me, if you would, and said, I'm going to take time out from here. I want you to focus on this right now. And see, sometimes we, we forget that God is a God that never changes, but we for eternity will always be changing, and that change starts now. It doesn't start in eternity. Our understanding of God starts now in this journey that we're on, and to think about eternity, we will never, ever know as much as our God, ever, 
forever. We will be learning about him and who he is forever. And that impacted my life as I was studying through that and then now turning back into the Holy Spirit study, which I'm uh, so grateful to be able to speak to you this morning on. You know, I, I agree with J.I. Packer in his opening statement. And it's funny, he made this statement, what, 35 years ago now or something when he wrote this book? The statement that the Holy Spirit is probably the most misaligned and misunderstood person of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You know what? We can make that same statement today. We really could. When you think about the teachings of the Holy Spirit, I think about the teachings in the Holy Spirit over my 44 years of being saved. It's usually centered around the charismatic movement, the Pentecostal movement, what's happening there. Very little talk is about how the Holy Spirit actually works in our lives as believers. And so I'm going to take you this morning on this journey I've been on as God has reminded me the power that he has given each of us. If we would just, if we would just submit to him and understand and allow that power in us to be unleashed. So weirdly, he took me back to, and I say weird because you wouldn't think you'd start with the Holy Spirit here, but he took me back to Exodus chapter 26. And in Exodus chapter 26, God has given Moses the instructions on how to build the tabernacle. And he says specific things to the people how this tabernacle is supposed to be built. And you have the altar of burning, burnt offering, right, where they made offerings, right? And then, then you had the holy of holy, or the holy place, right? That's where you had the altar of incense. And then you had this, imagine, 30 feet high, 60 feet wide, one inch, right, thick, right, just a heavy drape or veil, whatever you want to call it, right, that, that went over the most holy of holies. And the only person ever allowed in the holy of holies was the high priest. And when the high priest went in once a year to make the offering for the children of Israel, right, he always went in with a rope around him. Why? Because sometimes in making the offering, they literally would fall dead because they went into the presence of God with sin. And you're not allowed to go in the presence of God with sin. So as I started dwelling on that, and I began to think about, you know, what it was like. Now Christ comes. He comes to earth 2,000 years ago, and he walks this earth and he shares with the disciples the truths that are written in the Gospels. And Mark tells us in Mark 15, verse 37 to 38, it says that at the moment that Christ died, he, he breathed his last, right? The moment that happened, back in the temple, guess what happened? That veil, that drape, it ripped right in half could not happen by human hands it had to happen by god himself when god did that he opened up the most holy of holies to all of mankind you see sometimes when i read scripture maybe you're like me i read something like that right and i just breeze right through it oh good christ died he breathed and temple yep that good and then i'm on to the next chapter right? But because I'm studying, I'm, I'm meditating now. What does that really mean? Because see, that place of holies, of holies, of most holy, the Israelites, there was such a fear, they wouldn't even, they, they wouldn't go. Even the high priest had a fear, right? That's why there's a rope. Why? I might die. Pull me out if I do. But it's so significant. It's so significant because before Christ came, 
Only one person can come into that holy of holies, most holy place. But Hebrews tells us that all changed, right? If you want to read along with me, open your Bibles. I'm going to be in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verse, starting at verse 15. Starting at verse 15. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First he says, This is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my law in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. You see, up until Christ came, a yearly sacrifice had to be made to atone for the people's sins. And so every year, this high priest, whoever he was, he'd go and make the sacrifice. But that sacrifice never truly appeased the wrath of God. All it did was really contain it until God actually fulfilled what he planned, was that to bring his son, Jesus Christ. Verse 19, therefore, brothers and sisters, that's us, guys. Brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. That's the confidence we have. Because of the blood of Jesus, we now have the opportunity to go in the most holy of holy places. Holy Spirit was oftentimes in the Old Testament. We saw that. If you read the Old Testament, in the book of Judges, you see at times the Holy Spirit coming upon Judges, David, Samson, right? But Jesus, when he comes, he promises a different Holy Spirit. Not a different Holy Spirit, excuse me, but he promises a Holy Spirit that will not only possess certain individuals, but a Holy Spirit that will possess anyone who calls on the name of Jesus. He says this in John 14, 15 to 21 about the Holy Spirit. If you love me, keep my commands, he says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you, and before long the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me is the one, will be the one loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. And in verse 25 he says this, all this I have spoken while still with you. But the advocate, the advocate is the consoler, right? The helper, the confronter, the intercessor, right? The advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, but my peace I give you. I did not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You see, Christ told the disciples, right? I need to leave. But when I leave, don't worry because I'm going to give you the helper. And the helper actually is going to do greater things than if I was just here by myself. Because the reality is, Christ knew he could affect 12 people, right? 
And out of that 12, there's also another 70. And then you can maybe count the 120 that maybe he affected. But ultimately, we're limited on how many we can affect. What Christ has given them insight to is that the Holy Spirit, he's going to come in and dwell everybody's heart. And his ministry is going to be even greater than my ministry in the whole world. Because he's going to indwell every believer. And that's the first promise we have that we have to understand. We have the promise of the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 7, verse 37 and 39, the Holy Spirit is seen as the life-giving power. It says, now, on that last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and he cried out, saying, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And he who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being flows rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For the Spirit was yet not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. That truth to disciples is a reality for us today. That truth that he spoke to them, he was speaking to us in this very room. If we would believe in him, this spirit of truth will live in us. In John 14, 26, when he, Jesus was speaking specifically to the disciples, he said this regarding the Holy Spirit's teaching ministry. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. And so sometimes we have discussion, Kimberly and I, and about, well, I don't remember everything, and I don't remember like you remember. And I always remind her, and I remind any believer, if you are walking with Christ, and you are completely in submission of him, that means he's filled you up, which we're going to look at here in a little bit. His promise to us is that all the truth that you've been learning over the your years with him, whether it's for one week, one year, five years, 40 years, whatever you've learned, his promise is when you need to remember that, guess what? You're going to remember. Because you're in such complete submissiveness to him. You're allowing him to control every part of your life. And when you do that, there is amazing freedom as a believer. You would be amazed, I promise you, how less stress you will feel in life. How the anxieties that you feel will not be anxieties that you will feel anymore. Because when the Spirit of God controls you to that level, you realize that your life is completely in His hand to do whatever He desires to do with you. That includes if He desires to give you COVID-19 or not. One of my closest friends back in Washington, who also works for me, did everything. Wore the mask. Wore gloves. Used all sanitizer. This guy did it more than anybody on my team. He didn't even go to stores to shop. He let his wife do that for him. Right? Guess what? He calls me and says, I have COVID-19. Wow. Guys, you just don't know. But I can tell you he's a brother in the Lord. And so his whole attitude was, hey, I did what I thought I'd do right. God still chose to give it to me. So I'm going to live with it in grace. And he's going to teach me what he's going to teach me through it. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to witness. In John 15, 26, it says, The Spirit comes from the Father, right? Or, really, when it says from the Father, it really means from the Father's side. 
It has the same idea when Jesus goes back to the right side of the Father, right? The Holy Spirit's coming from the same exact place, from the side of the Father. And when he comes, right, the Father will, right, the Father, excuse me, when the Helper comes, whom I send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth, who proceeds the Father, proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. You see, part of the reason the Holy Spirit lives in us is so that he can testify about Christ through us. Every believer should be a testimony for Jesus Christ. I'm going to embarrass Kimberly, but that's okay. Our neighbors, new neighbors to our left, just moved in a month or so ago. And Kimberly's, we've been getting to know Ron and Terry, and Terry was out front about a week or a half ago, I think it was. And uh, Kimberly went and started talking to Terry. And uh, out of the blue, Terry says, you're a Christian, aren't you? Well, yes, I am, <laughs> as a matter of fact. And she goes, I could just tell by your life. And then she proceeded to say, would you pray for my daughter? It looks like she's going to have a miscarriage. And I'm concerned for her. And she did. You see, as believers, we need to be that testimony to everybody in our lives, to our neighbors, to our children, to our family members, to our friends, to our co-workers. Christ should be what we're about in every aspect of life. J.R. Packer poses this question in his book, and he says, so if the Holy Spirit is the one who gives life-giving power, this Holy Spirit who is the Spirit of truth, if he will teach us by bringing us his truth to us and gives us the power to witness, then why is it, as J.R. Packer says, the average Christian deep down is in a complete fog as to what the Holy Spirit does in one's life? And honestly, I agree with that statement. You know, I don't only travel the Midwest, I travel all of the Northwest, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, was Alaska up until this whole thing, will be again, Nevada, Ohio, talk to many believers. And it amazes me how many are in a fog of really the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, oftentimes when they think of the Holy Spirit, they're thinking charismatic. You mean I got to speak in tongues? You mean I got to do all of this? I, miracles? No, I don't mean that at all. Because whether you believe in that or not, right? not everybody would have that gift regardless. It's just the truth. We're talking something different. In chapter 6, he goes on and he says this, It is an extraordinary thing that those who profess to care so much about Christ should know and care so little about the Holy Spirit. He goes on to say, Many Christians really have no idea what difference it would make if there was no Holy Spirit in the world and I would add, if there was no Holy Spirit in your life. Because we don't take time. You see, we're good at God the Father. Right? We know God, because we know God Old Testament, and God done Old Testament's all over the place, and we see different things there, right? And, and Jesus is always in the gospel talking about his Father. And we know, we know Jesus God, God man, came. What we don't realize is the power of God, Holy Spirit, third person in Trinity, is so powerful in our lives. Because he's the same God Father, the same God Son, he's just God Spirit now. Right? Three persons in one. It's an amazing thought if, if you dwell on this. It's been very convicting for me over the last several weeks. 
as I had to be reminded of these simple truths. These simple truths of who the Holy Spirit is in my life. See, the two main points Packer makes in this chapter is that without the Holy Spirit, think about this. Without the Holy Spirit, there's really no gospel and no New Testament. Without the Holy Spirit, the second point, there would be no faith and no new birth. Short, there'd really be no new Christians. Couldn't be. We need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit of whom Christ promised to each of us as believers in him. Which brings me to my next point. The Holy Spirit, when you come to faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit immediately does something for each of us. And that is, he seals us for eternity. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, many of us are familiar with this verse. It says, it says this, it says, In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and having also believed, you were sealed. Sealed. Okay, what was I sealed with? He tells us, in him with the Holy Spirit. A promise. The Holy Spirit, a promise that Christ said, I'm going to give when I leave. It's better I leave because the Spirit's going to even do greater things. The Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. We don't acquire possession of to it until, we're, until we pass from this world and we pass the glory with Him. That's when we acquire it. This ceiling is so significant because I, I, I have, in my 40 years, I've talked to so many believers who, who are worried about their salvation. How, how do I, what, what if God takes it away? What if, uh, can, can, can I lose it? The truth is, that one verse alone, Ephesians 4, right, or 1, 13, tells us as believers there is no way any of you if you've given your life to christ can lose your salvation ever so if you have any doubt in your mind remove it if you have confessed christ jesus as lord as savior and you submit to him the moment you did that he sealed you for eternity this sealing cannot be broken God won't even break his ceiling on us. It's secure forever. So we need to learn to live in that hope, despite all the trials of life and everything that we all go through, and we all experience trials. None of us in this room do not experience the trials of life. None of us get to escape that. Sometimes we think we're an island unto ourselves, that no one experiences what I experience. You don't understand. Your kids aren't like mine. You don't understand. You don't have a boss like me. You don't understand. My church is going through hard times, and they're just, you know what? That is life for everybody. No one escapes it. The beauty of the ceiling is this. In MacArthur, in his commentary, he lists four things. Four things. He says, the ceiling represents security. So when you think of Daniel, and when Daniel was thrown into the den, and, and, and the king came, and he put his signet ring, right? And, and then he also had all those other guys actually accused Daniel. He said, yeah, you're going to seal it too with yours, right? And it's sealed, which meant it, it, it can't be broken, right? Security. Authentic authenticity. The sealing is authentic because why? Who are we sealed by? The Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that actually seals us. You can't get more authentic than that in your life. Sealing also represents ownership. 
When you seal something, you're saying, this is mine. When the Holy Spirit seals us, what he's telling the whole world and every believer, including Satan himself, the devil, is that that child belongs to me and not you. And you have no right over that person. And then authority. Sealing always represents authority. We saw that. You'll see that in Esther chapter 8 when Esther goes to the king and and asks, hey, would you write a letter for me? Because they're going to kill all the Jews, all the Israelites. And the king said, take it. And this represents my signet ring, represents my authority. That's what the Holy Spirit represents in our lives. That's the truth that we should dwell on. When we're feeling lonely and sad, the truth is you're sealed for eternity. No one, no one can take that from you. I have a lot to cover this morning. We'll see how we do. God has been teaching me a lot. In 2 Corinthians 5, uh, chapter 5, verse 5, it says, Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has also given us a spirit as a guarantee. So not only are we sealed with the Spirit of God, the Spirit also guarantees our salvation. That is a beautiful thing to dwell on as believers. That we are sealed and guaranteed. No one takes it from us. But you know what? Not only do we get to go into the presence of God, not only... Are we sealed, right, with the Holy Spirit? And this is where I think Christians have the most trouble in. My next point. The Holy Spirit fills us up with his presence in our lives. In the book of Ephesians, it says, chapter 5, verse 18. Excuse me one moment. It says this, And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. He, so he gives an analogy, because we know what wine, if you drink too much wine or any too much of any alcohol, what happens to your body and functions? You start to lose control. The Spirit says, Paul says, don't allow that to happen. But instead, he says, the opposite should be true. You should lose all control to who? To the Holy Spirit who will fill you up with his presence, his life. You see, when we're talking about filling of the Holy Spirit, sometimes people get the sealing confused with the filling. They are two separate things. Two separate things for the believer. Your sealing happened at your point of of salvation, and it's done. There's nothing else you can do. But the filling up of Christ is daily, moment by moment sometimes in our lives. The filling of Christ is not a filling either. It's not like, oh, I feel like the Holy Spirit's in me. That's not what it means. It's not referring to some type of dramatic experience like they saw in Acts chapter 2, right? When the Holy Spirit at Pentecost came, it came like a a rushing wind of fire, and they overcame. We saw that one other time in experience in Acts chapter 9 when first time the Gentiles, right, the centurion, gave the whole household gave their lives. It was almost like a second Pentecost. But the reality is, That's not what the feeling of the Spirit is. Baptism in the Spirit is also not the feeling of the Spirit. You hear that often among our charismatic brothers. You know, have you been baptized in the Spirit? Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, he says, For by one Spirit were you all baptized into one body. That's it. That happens at salvation, guys. That doesn't happen like 
this extra special experience in life. So what does it mean then to be spirit-filled? I want to read three different trans, three different uh, commentaries to you because I think they all they say something very similar, and we can grab the truth of really what this means. The first one's from the expositor's commentary, and it says this. <clears throat> excuse me. The theological implications of being filled, okay, and it comes from the Greek word of a plural, if you would, are crucial for a biblical doctrine of the Holy Spirit. The imperative makes this a command. See, that's one sometimes we forget when it says to be filled. It's actually command. That's a command from God that we as believers need to be filled with His Spirit, which is, again, different from being sealed with his spirit. The present tense rules out any once and for all reception of the spirit, but points to a continuous re- replenishment, literally going on, this commentary says, going on being filled. And it doesn't appear here, this commentary says, Paul's not urging his readers to enter into some new experience. For example, Paul's not saying, You know, up until now, you've not been filled with the Spirit, so, hey, start now. That's not what he's saying. This is something they're already doing daily. And he's encouraging them, continue to be filled in the Spirit. Wayne Gruden says this in Systematic Theology. He says, be filled with the Holy Spirit uses a present tense imperative verb that could be more explicitly translated Again, similar to what the expository uh, commentary said. Be continually be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's something that we actively do all the time in our lives. So what is it implying? It implies that this is something that should be repeatedly happening to Christians. Therefore, Gruden says, it's appropriate to understand feeling with the Holy Spirit not as a one-time event, but an event that can occur over and over again in the Christian life. John MacArthur says this in his commentary on the book of Ephesians. He says that this word, and it is, I looked, I, I verified actually because I love Greek, is, is filled, translated, as a present passive imperative. Present passive imperative. And if you look at, um, I, just, I just drew a blank on the website, but you'll see where it actually translates. That's exactly how it translates. Which means then, John says, more literally meaning, literal meaning is being kept filled. Really no different from what the other writers are saying. Being kept filled. It is a command that includes the idea of conscious continuation. Being filled with the Holy Spirit is not an option for believers, but it's a mandate for us. It's a mandate that we're filled with His Spirit. You see, no Christian can fulfill God's will apart from his life, apart, his life apart from being filled with the Holy Spirit. You hear that? We really can't fulfill what God wants to accomplish in our life unless we actually are filled with His Spirit. I really believe you can be saved and not be filled with the Spirit. You can be saved and not submit yourself to God today and do things out of the flesh. We do it all the time. That's why Paul's reminding us to be filled. Because of that spiritual battle. John goes on and says this continuous aspect of being filled, being kept filled, involves the day by day, moment by moment submission to the Spirit's control. The passive aspect indicates that this is not something we do, but that we allow to be done to us. The filling is entirely the work of the Spirit Himself. 
But he works only through our willingness to submit to him. Right? So we don't like tell, hey, Spirit, come fill me. He fills us when we submit our lives to him this day. We commit ourselves. We confess sin. We say, you lead us. This Greek word has, you know, a, a different trans, has different translations depending upon where you read it in the New Testament. One idea is an idea of a, of a sailboat, right? So if you take a sailboat out, out into the lake or into the ocean, if you don't put the sails up, it doesn't move, right? The idea is you open the sails, right? And when the sail is open, what happens? The wind, wherever direction the wind is going, it then carries, right? It carries that sailboat in that direction. When you're filled with the Spirit, it means we're allowing God to move us in the direction that He wants to move us. It also carries the idea of permeation, right? In the Old Testament, we don't think about it a lot in today's 21st century because we have refrigerators and things like that. But in the Old Testament, when they want to preserve things, right, they had to use salt a lot. And salt, they did two, two reasons, for the permeation of it, right, and also for the flavor of it, to allow flavor to it. See, the idea here is that when the Holy Spirit is permeating our lives, and all that we think and all that we do, right, and say, then we become a reflection, right, of his divine presence in our life. That's what, we, that's what it means to be filled. When we talk about the permeation, he's a reflection, like that neighbor that said, you're a Christian, aren't you? Right? Because that's how we should be. We should be a reflection to people all around us. At all times. Another example of this word, plural, plural P L E R O O, carries the idea of total control. Total control. And it, that total control can go either way, right? So in Luke, when, when it talks about in Luke chapter 5, verse 26, it's talking about fear. They're filled with fear. The same words used. They've allowed themselves to be filled with fear instead of the Spirit of God. Or anger, Luke 6, 11, same word used. Or it's used of Stephen, right? In chapter 6, verse 5, it says he was filled with the Holy Spirit. His life was so evident they, that they could see that he was filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Even Satan is filled with lies, right? Satan fills people with lies, right? We see that in Ananias. When Ananias came back, Peter said, why have you lied? Why has Satan filled you with lies? But perhaps the best example I like is the example of the glove. You know, if we have a glove, and if I put the glove right here on this platform and I leave that glove alone, that glove is useless. The glove in itself cannot do nothing. But when I put my hand in that glove, the purpose of that glove starts to be fulfilled. See, that's what happens, guys. Apart from the Holy Spirit, we can do nothing. We're like the glove. It's only when we allow the Holy Spirit to fill our lives that true transformation starts for each of us. We need to choose to walk in the Spirit and to be filled with Him. You see, it's not until we submit to the Holy Spirit and allow Him to fill us up with His presence so that we are in complete submission to Him and what He wants to accomplish in our lives that we're truly able to grow in our faith and sanctification with them. Let me give you an example. Because I said to you, you can be a Christian and not be filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul addresses this issue in 1 Corinthians. This is what he says. 
you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 to 15, he says, Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones, and he's talking about the foundation of Christ, right, and, and, and what the apostles have done. You build on this foundation. He just got talking about some say I'm Apollos, some say I'm this, right? He's talking about if you build on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a, a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. What's Paul saying? He's saying sometimes, Christians, you go through life, you got wood, hay, straw. And if that's how you live your life, it's going to burn. But thank God, because you're sealed, you're going to get into heaven, right? The idea is there, you're actually going to smell almost like smoke you're going to get in. But you're going to get in, because that's the promise. But he says, if, if it's gold, silver, or precious stones, it goes through the fire, that's stuff that's going to bring glory to God. So the dross might fall out, but the gold, the silver, the precious stone is there. And it's not that gold is better than silver or silver better than precious stone. or pre Actually, in Old Testament, they were equal because sometimes you needed precious stones was actually more valuable than gold. The point of what Paul is saying is, what works are you doing? He's telling us here, you could be a Christian and kind of like, just go through life. And you're saved. And thank God for the sealing of the Holy Spirit. But you've never really fully understood the power that each of us possess, that you possess in Christ. It's amazing when you start to realize that. You know, you can be a, a person that helps in Awana your whole life. You could be someone that serves in the church your whole life. And that could be wood, hay, stubble, straw. Because if you didn't do it with complete submission, and if you didn't do it with the understanding that when people walk into this building, that they are looking to see Christ in you, and you're just more worried about your task... You're doing wood, hay, and straw. That's not what Christ wants from us. Christ wants us to be completely submissive to him so that the Holy Spirit that indwells each of us in this room that claim him lives through us, and it's a shining example. What do you have? When I was saved at the age of 14, I might have shared with some of you, I remember going into this into church. It was Grace Community Church. Didn't know Christ. I was invited by someone I didn't even really know who was a friend of my sister, right? I'd just been arrested for Grand Theft Auto. My dad, my parents said, you're, you're, you're grounded forever. You're never going to do anything. You're, you just blew it. I'd been kicked out of four schools. Four schools. Okay, that meant when you get kicked out, it means uh, we never want to see your son back here again, right? I remember going to my, my dad and saying, hey, these people, I don't even know them, but they said, that they, I know I'm grounded, but can, can I go to church? And I think my parents just must have flung up their arms and said, what else do we do with this kid, right? I went to church. Walk in to this church. There's 200 kids, literally, teenagers, right? Back then, I was ninth grade, okay? And they're, they're screaming. They're having fun. They're laughing. They're playing these games, and then they sit down. And the crazy thing is, 200 kids sit down, and this guy up here and these other people are playing a guitar and that, and they're singing songs, and, and they're all singing. And then, and then he had the audacity to open this book and start teaching these 200 kids who are like mesmerized by this guy teaching them the Bible. And I'm looking around as a young 14-year-old kid going, what in the world do these kids? What do they have? 
Because that's not what my experience in life. But you know what, guys? That's what people should experience when they come to our church. What do these people have? We should be so filled with the Holy Spirit in our lives that it's so dynamic that people go, what do they have? I need to have that. That's what the power of the Holy Spirit, that's what the Holy Spirit's waiting to do at this church, to unleash himself as we submit to him and his working in our church. That's where we find real power, beloved. Being filled starts with confession. It starts with confession. Man, if you don't start your every day, in your every day, and start your every day going to the Lord, asking him to search your heart out, you're missing on being filled by the Spirit. And I'm going to try to wrap up soon. What time do we have to wrap up? What's that? Well, I'm going to try. Well, no, I'm not going to do that. Look at here. Christ said this. He said, if, if anyone wants to come after me, right? We know this verse, Luke 9, 23. If you want to come after me, if you want to follow me, then, then you got to deny yourself, right? You got you to gotta pick up that cross, right? And you, and you, you got to follow me. That means, guys, we gotta, we got to stop hanging on to the things that we want to hang on to. The bitterness, the anger. I didn't like the way I grew up. I'm mad at my parents. I'm mad at my dad. I'm mad at my work. I'm mad at whatever it is. I, I don't like the way the church handled things, so I'm mad at the church. I'm mad at the elders. You know what? That is the wrong thinking. I'm going to show you, too, here in Scripture in a moment. See, to be filled means to live in an ever-present consciousness of Jesus Christ in your mind daily. It doesn't mean we just come to church and then we check out when we leave and then we go to work and then, you know, I'm a different person at work because, hey, it's work. It's not Christian. I don't need to be Christ-like there. Yeah, you do. He asks you to deny yourself in every aspect of your life, not just when you're in front of other believers. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says, But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as the Spirit of the Lord, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Look at transformation. If you want to grow from glory to glory in sanctification, you have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. There is no other way of growth in our lives. It's impossible. You can't do it on your own. But we try to, trust me. Right? That was her reminder to me. I think you're trying to do this on your own. You might want to wake up a little bit, you know, and think about what you're doing. Huh. You're right. Ouch. You know? Ouch. A couple more thoughts, and I'll try to wrap it up here. I started with this whole idea of the ark of God the temple of God, the tabernacle of God, and where the holies and most holy was. And that we talked about how the, that veil, when Christ died, it was just split down the middle. The reason being is because as believers who trust Christ, we now are that very temple. I don't think we understand that sometimes. The reason we don't go is because the Holy Spirit dwells our, in our lives and they, it, we're called the temple of God. It's an amazing thought. Paul tells us that in 1 Corinthians 3, 16, 17. He says, do you not know that you are the temple of God, that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man destroys the temple of God, <laughs> guess what? God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. That's what we are. That's why Peter said, right, you shall be holy, for I am holy. He's quoting Old Testament scripture. We are to be holy because we are holy, because the Holy Spirit indwells in our lives. If we would live with that understanding every day to realize, oh my goodness, God Almighty lives in me, 
in the form of the Holy Spirit, and I am the temple of God, I have all the confidence in the world to go before him and pray and ask and know and assure that he hears me. Paul says the same thing, similar in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, or in uh, Romans, excuse me, or no, yeah, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you're not your own? You see, the problem is sometimes we like to think that, you know, I own my body. I own everything. I own my house. I own my cars. I own my kids. I own my job. You know what? Paul just kind of destroyed that, whom you have from God, the Holy Spirit, and that you are, that you are not your own. When we gave our lives to Christ, we gave everything to him. Everything. That's why doulos, Paul often uses in the scriptures of servant. It means I completely have surrendered everything. I've surrendered every right to any decision in my life to God, to Jesus Christ, to the leading of the Holy Spirit in my life. I'm going to skip a couple things because I want to conclude with a few verses because I want you to have a grasp really of what it means to be filled because this is where the com- real confusion comes in in John 1 chapter 1 verse 9 John is speaking to believers and he says to these believers if you confess your sins he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins See, he's speaking to believers. He's not speaking to unchristians, those who don't know Christ. He's speaking to those of us who know Christ, who still sin. And why do we know that? Because guess what? Right before that, what does he say, right? He says this in verse 7 and 8. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus' Son cleanses us from all sin. And he says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. He's writing to Christians, right? Because right now, during this time, there were certain Christians, alleged Christians, who said, oh, we have no sin, we're perfect. And John's saying, "Uh uh-uh, no one's perfect yet. We're just forgiven, and we're on that path of righteousness. In verse 10, he says, and if we say we have not sinned, we make him, Jesus, a liar. Ooh, don't want to do that. And his word is not in us. You see, so part of our daily routine needs to be confession of sin. Because we're still fighting the battle every day. It's the flesh against the spirit. The flesh wants to rule out. And that's what was happening. That's what Kimberly saw. Like, hon, guess what? Flesh is winning right now. And the spirit isn't winning. You need to change direction. As believers, we need to be able to do that to one another without being offended. We need to be able to come up and say, we got to change direction. We need to admonish one another. That's what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians. I'm going to leave you with two more, two more verses or, that Paul says because it's very important that you grasp this, and I'll, I'll close it. In Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14 to 23, he says this, We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, Who are the unruly? Those who would cause disruption in your church. We, not just the elders, we as a body of Christ are admonished to those who are unruly to admonish them. That's our command. He says, encourage the faint-hearted. Who are those? Those who, are, who live in fear and doubt. Look, at, let's be real. Some believers live in fear and doubt. We as believers need to come alongside them and not mock them. We need to come alongside them and encourage them in their faith walk. He says, and help the weak. Who are those? He's talking about the weak here, the spiritual, the moral, who, who are struggling, maybe with pornography, maybe, maybe with different issues on morality. We've got to come alongside them, not beat them up. He says, be patient with everybody. See that no one repays evil for evil. But always seek after which is good for one another and for all people. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Everything gives thanks. 
for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And then look what he says. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecy, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Paul is writing here, not necessarily to the individual Christian in this passage. He's writing to the assembly. He's writing to the church. He's telling the church, as a church, don't quench the spirit. It means like if there's a fire, don't pour water over it. So that, because the spirit never completely dies, but it's just simmering. Because as a church, we're quenching it. And as a church, we need to be united in our front for what we believe and hold true in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we got to learn to forgive one another, not hold on. That's our admonishment from God through the Apostle Paul. Then he says, don't grieve the Spirit. Do not grieve the Spirit. Literally, do you realize that when you sin and the Spirit is in you, that you can make the Holy Spirit of God weep? Because of your sin? Because you're allowing sin into your life? And the Holy Spirit weeps when you do that? Because I think because He knows the victory He has if you would allow Him to set you free and live in that. Live in His filling up. So much more to say there that I won't. But I'm going to leave with this verse. Philippians chapter 4. Many of us have memorized it. We know it. But I'm going to read it. Chapter 4, verse 4 to 9, Paul says this. Rejoice always again, I will say rejoice, and let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. That idea of rejoicing, is a, it's imperative. It's not like, hey, think about rejoicing. He says, rejoice always. That means no matter what's happening to our lives. That means it doesn't matter if I got in a car crash today. I don't want to get in a car crash. It doesn't matter. It means in everything, rejoice. He says this, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right and pure and lovely and whatever is a good repute, whatever is highly regarded, right, of ex any excellent, anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. And then he says, the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. Practice them. You see, the key to being filled in the holy, with the Holy Spirit and the God of living, you got to change your thinking. And so if you struggle with anxiety, you struggle with depression, you struggle with life's fears, I'm going to challenge you to do a personal study just on Philippians chapter 4. Because when you realize the freedom we have, then there's great freedom in Christ. And that feeling will change you guys, I promise you. I promise you because that's what the Word promises, not me. That's just what Jesus promised. That's what his holy scriptures promise. Let us close in prayer. Father, your truth reigns in our hearts. Holy Spirit, I pray, I, I just pray that, uh, that your church is encouraged that your church is strengthened by the power we have in you, the fact that we are the temple of God and the Holy Spirit, you, Holy Spirit, reside in our lives. Oh, that should cause us alone to rejoice and rejoice always. Teach us to be filled with your presence daily. Teach us to confess our sins and invite you in our lives by submitting to whatever you want to do. Reveal to us those areas that need to change that we hold on to that are not allowing us to grow in faith 
or as Paul says, from glory to glory. I pray our hearts are prepared even more as we continue to worship you this morning through fellowship. We worship you through song and praise, and we worship you through the more of a teaching and preaching of your holy word. And may we stand firm on these truths. May our church, may our church be a shining light in this dark world that we live in. May we be a shining example of those who come in and they see something different. Not because of us, because of Holy Spirit, what you are doing and transforming in our lives on a daily basis. Truly, our desire is to give you all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. Thank Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for loving us. In your name we pray, amen.